What a privilege it is to be here and gathered with you during this Christmas season. Would you pray with me? Let's ask God to bless the preaching of the word. Heavenly Father, now is our opportunity uh, to see the magic of the season that has less to do with Christmas cookies and Christmas lights and has everything to do with you, our Savior. You are real. You are here. And now bless us as we hear your word. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. You are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Hope is essential to our hearts. To prove this point, I wanted to bring up a story that I've referenced a few times from this stage. It's the story uh, called Unbroken. And there was a book written about it, and it was turned into a movie about a World War II vet named Louis Zamperini. And I usually refer to this story as a powerful example of forgiveness. Uh, Why? Because he was a prisoner of war in the South Pacific. Uh, He was tortured, and he survived. And his story is that after that experience, he went back and he forgave his captors. It's incredible. But today I wanted to pick up on the part of the story where the plane crashes and he's stuck on this raft with two others and they're hungry and they're tired and they're in shark-infested waters and we see the need for hope. Because out of the three people, him and another guy named Phil survives, but one man named Mac does not. And the one documenting the story in the book Unbroken kind of uh, shares with us what was going on in the internal ideologies and the internal processing. Here it says from Unbroken, Though all three face the same hardship, their differing perceptions of it appeared to be shaping their fates. Louise and Phil's hope displaced their fear and inspired them to work toward their survival. And each success renewed their physical and emotional vigor. Max's resignation seemed to paralyze him, and the less he participated in their efforts to survive, the more he slipped and again eventually died. So I'll say it again, hope is essential to the heart. Hope is needed. There there is power in a person who has hope, and there is also a weird bad power in those who have lost hope in what it does to us. But here's the problem. You ever lose hope? You ever been in a season where things weren't going your way and you just felt overwhelmed and you're like, I I can't handle it. I I have no hope that it's going to get better. Maybe it was because of a bad decision you made or or a bad decision someone else made and, and, and you're like, man, this doesn't seem to be going anywhere good. How can I get hope? You ever have that in an area of your life? Like some things can be going on well, but in this area, if I'm honest, I just... I don't have hope. It just seems stagnant and stuck, and it doesn't seem like and it's going to get better. And I'm frustrated even talking about working on that area. It's, it's hopeless. You know, if I'm vulnerable as a pastor, I think one of the reasons God has people be pastors is so I can relate, but I know what it's like to lose hope. I know what it's like to lose hope in a season or in an area of life. But this is a problem. Now, even psychologically, uh, they would dig in and they would tell us what happens when we lose hope. So so consider this quote uh, about hopelessness. Hopelessness should be taken seriously. It's associated with the increased suicide risk, lower quality of life, and increased anxiety symptoms. It's also a key symptom of depression. As we've gathered at Amazing Love today, and by the way, welcome everyone. Glad to see you. What if this place was without hope? Just go there for a moment. What if the goal of the Christian lifestyle, as some would say, would basically be just to commiserate? We get together and we share personal tragedy or collective woe, or we just talk about how broken the world is, and then we go home and we come back for next week. That's all we do. To put it a different way, what if there was no Christ in Christmas? What if the best part of this year was the idea that we could go to the Home Alone house in Winnetka after we watched the movie. Or the greatest part of the year is that we could go to the Walnut Room, see a pink and purple tree, eat mac and cheese with the kids. I think that's what they serve, right? I don't know. It smells like pack of cheese. But anyway, what if that was the greatest thing that we did? Or what if the only stories that we knew were the Christmas Carol and the Nutcracker? 
I don't know about you, but that's not a great Christmas celebration. Like, I want something more. If there's no Christ of Christmas, like, what are we doing? You you remember when Paul looked at life this way? Does anyone remember? So it's in 1 Corinthians 15, and it's the great resurrection chapter. And he didn't ask, what if there's no Christ of Christmas? He asked, what if there is no resurrection and Easter? And he started us to get us to think about what, what the ramifications would be. And this is what he said. If there's no resurrection, your faith is futile. And you're still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. Digging in. If there's no resurrection, faith is just a crutch for the weak. And the guilt and shame that we want to get away from, which most people do by trying to just do better next time, we really have no good answer for. We have no hope of afterlife, and we're to be pitied more than all people because the ways of Christ in the world's eyes look like weakness, even though there's really strength there. But if there is no Christ, if there is no ways beyond this world, then what are we doing trying to be kind and forgiving and selfless and generous and all these other things? But is there hope? Is there a Christ of Christmas? And because every Sunday is supposed to be a mini Easter, I get to remind you, there is a resurrection in Christ. He is risen. He is risen indeed. And what this means is that faith is not a crutch. Faith is a rock-solid hope. It is sure of being sure of what we're hoping for and certain of what we do not see yet. That's what faith is. And there is forgiveness. It doesn't matter what you've done or what you could do in the future. The cross of Jesus Christ covers all of that sin, and we are cleansed. It means there is an afterlife and glory beyond compare, joys that will never end. No Christmas celebration will eclipse the joy of eternity. All because Christ is born. Because the promise given at the very beginning that the woman would have an offspring to crush the devil's head. He came, and his name is Jesus. And if you're filling in blanks today, your first fill-in is this. Christmas means that hope is certain. That's how Christians refer to hope. It's, it's not like a wish. It's not like we hope the bears are going to be good someday in this decade. That's not how we're hoping. No, this is sure. It's not a matter of if, but it's a matter of when. This will happen. Everything in Christ will happen. And so we get a pause during this season, and we get to see all of the various presents that, that Jesus gives. So I referred to a Christmas tree reminding of us a cross and a manger. So a present as we use them, as we take the things of the world, and, and we morph them into the things of faith, we remember that Jesus has the best presents. Because Jesus brings hope. What else does he bring? He brings joy, and he brings love, and he brings peace. And all of these are ours because of the Christ of Christmas. And friends, in any age, they are needed. And so now I wanted to dig into the God's word with you this morning. And I want to set kind of the stage for how God's word enters into the context of history. So before this word from God that we're going to consider from Luke chapter 1, feel free to open your Bibles There were 400 years of silence. The last word from God came from the prophet Malachi in around the 400s BC. And in the meantime, there was no new prophet, no new revelation, no explanation of the promises to come. Rather, uh, we find in the 300s BC that Alexander the Great takes over Jerusalem through a conquest We see a Maccabean revolt. The Jews revolted in the hundreds B.C., tried to take back some of their territory, take back some of their power. And then in 63 B.C., um, Pompey came in, once again taking over Jerusalem, oppressing them, occupying Jerusalem, and making them slaves. So so this is all going on in this 400 years of silence. No new prophet, no word from God, just oppression by the Greeks, oppression by the Romans. And today is the the first time after 400 years that God enters in. God speaks, and he renews hope. 
and we too get to be renewed by this word. Why don't we stand as we hear God's word? I invite you to stand in honor of God speaking to us. Luke 1, it says, Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to drink wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Well, Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man and my wife is well along in years, but God was going to make it happen. These are the powerful words. Before you sit down, can you say to your neighbor, hope is here? Hope is here? Hope is here. Please be seated. All right, so we live in a world of spiritual warfare. Our enemy, the devil, is like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And what I recognize is much of this spiritual warfare is invisible. It goes on in our minds. And what I really believe is that the devil is at work trying to get us to be a hopeless people, trying to, to steal our hope in, in various ways by, by his interpretations as he works in our mind. And so what I've come to the conclusion is that there is a battle that's so important in spiritual warfare so that we be a people of hope, so that we don't lose our hope. And this battle is a wrestling match between how I feel and what God has revealed. Okay? That's the, the wrestling match I want to talk about just a little bit in our time together, my first part of this message. So I was a wrestler. I want to bring up the idea of wrestling, if, if you're not accustomed to it. Uh, you have one opponent. Uh, this will be feelings. You have another opponent. This will be God's word. And, um, and we want to know, you know, who's going to win the wrestling match. Will, will feelings pin down God's word? To the degree that now I'm going to translate and interpret my life or situations by my feelings. And my feelings will either confirm or deny that God is true or God is good. Or are we going to allow God's word to pin down and come on top of my feelings? That regardless of the gamut of emotion, the experiences that I have, however it feels... I'm going to go with God's revelation and make sure that my feelings are pinning down by that. I bring up this wrestling match because I, I think this is so important. And what I would tell you is I've seen many, many Christians, especially today, say feelings should come on top of God's word. And let me give you an example of what happens when we do this. So in the Bloomer household a couple weeks ago, um, my daughter was coming home from school and I had made tacos, and they were good tacos. I put love into the tacos. I got those corn shells that you can buy for less than a dollar from Aldi. They make fresh. Do you know what I'm talking about? If you haven't heard of these yet, please pick them up. These corn shells, it starts with an M. I forget the name, but they're amazing. And I toasted them, and I got the rice out, and I cut up lime, and I had some cilantro, and I did refried beans so you could take one shell and make like a double-decker taco if you remember those. And I was set for a great Taco Friday until I got the call. And it was about 20 minutes before Taco Friday, and my daughter called from our very old Prius, and she sent a picture of what happened to the Prius. And so now my plans have changed. And thankfully, she's on the side of the toll road by Boughton Bowling Brook, and so she's kind of in a safe place, and... So I go and I pack up all the stuff. Thankfully, I have a spare wheel and I get the jack and I get the tools that I think that I need, including a hammer, because you never know. And, um, and so I'm going there. And I get there and the car is jacked up. And have you ever been on the side of the road with cars passing by? It doesn't matter where you are. That's a vulnerable thing to feel. Um, and the car is jacked up. And, and here's the problem. The wheel ain't coming off. And if you're a mechanic, you might know why this happens. But rust, friends, rust. And so that thing had been rusted on there, and now I'm doing one of, 
right? I'm, I'm harnessing all the strength that I have, and it's not working. So I get a hammer. And I don't need this rim anyway because I got a second one. And I start banging on one side, and then I bang on the other side with a hammer. I should have had like a rubber hammer, but I didn't. I just used a regular old hammer. I was beating this rim to death. And in the middle of this emotion, I could be interpreting this situation by my feelings. And if I did, this is what it would sound like. God, you're not good. I had tacos ready, God, and you knew it. God, I prayed before I came. I even anticipated the situation, and the rim isn't coming off. God, you said you were almighty. Show your almighty strength, God. God, you said you would work all things for my good. I'm not sure how this is for my good in this moment when the wheel's not coming off. And if I interpret it by feelings, that's what it could look like. But what if I let God's word interpret the situation? Well, then I'd say, God, I know I'm on the side of the road, but you got angels. And those angels can direct cars. So I'm going to do what I can and put it on the side, but I'm going to trust in you. And God, I know that things happen in a broken world. And you told me that I must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, but, but I'm going to realize that you still love me, even though it doesn't feel good right now. And God, even though this wheel ain't coming off, I know it will. Because you've made a way, and you're going to make a way. I don't know the answer yet, and by the way, it finally came off. But you're going to make a way. And that experience, which we all have, that's why I share personal stories, because you have your story. That experience happens every day, every minute, that we are either saying, I'm going to interpret this by my feelings, or I'm going to interpret it with God's revealings, God's truth. And in 2 Corinthians, I have this this verse that just helps us understand the importance of this wrestling match. It says, we must demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. We must take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. We must be a people who know how to take God's revealed word and tell our feelings to say mercy. Because I know, God, what you've done got some reverb, but that's all right. And this is what it looks like in spiritual warfare. So I don't know if you've ever come here and confessed your sins and you feel guilty yet. You feel ashamed yet. It was a tough week. What are you going to trust? Are you going to walk out today feeling guilty or are you going to trust what God has revealed that you are forgiven because of the cross of Jesus Christ? I pray, I hope that you trust God's revealing over your feelings. You're going to have times where you've prayed and prayed and prayed and there is no seeming answer. And it doesn't feel like God is hearing you. And what are you going to trust? Are you going to trust what God has revealed about prayer? That he hears the prayers of the righteous? Or the feeling that it doesn't seem he's answering, at least not according to my timeline or my plan. This is so important. In one particular area that's easy to lose hope is to question the power of prayer. Have you ever questioned the power of prayer? I'm going to be vulnerable once again. There have been points in my life where I knew God existed. It's not that, but I questioned the efficacy of prayer. Prayed and prayed and prayed. Begged and pleaded. Prayed and prayed and prayed. Begged and pleaded. And it seemed like heaven was silent. And I think this is a common experience. I, I was reading the Psalms, and, and this week in the Psalms, this is what a, a, a psalmist says, the sons of Korah, that I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Like, I'm just going to be straight out, God, like, it feels like you've forgotten me. And then I consider our story today, and, and the people of that time, they had every reason to feel like God was not on their side, to feel hopeless. Oppressed by the Greeks, oppressed by the Romans, nothing's happening, more oppression, ah! And then Zechariah, he had prayed for a child. And it's past the point. It's past the point. And, and he puts it in a, a euphemistic way when it comes to being old. He says, my wife is well advanced in years. <laughs> you gotta love that. 
And so we don't know how old Elizabeth is. I was doing some research. Some say specifically she was 88. I don't know how they arrived on that. Some say 60 to 80. What I'm going to do from context is say she's beyond birthing years, well advanced in years. She prayed and prayed and prayed. Nothing. Until, until. Don't be afraid, Zachariah. Can you say this phrase with me? Your prayer has been heard. Woo! All this time, I didn't know. I didn't know. I felt forgotten. I didn't know I could hope. It felt hopeless. But God shows up and he says, your prayer has been heard. Have you struggled with hopelessness? Have you, like me, ever gotten to prayer and been like, I'm, I'm not sure I trust prayer anymore. And think of how the devil wins that spiritual warfare because if he can keep the church from praying, oh my goodness. Have you ever questioned the character of God? And think if the devil wins that battle. If God is no longer good, you, you could be done with the whole God thing forever. You ever question God's strength? He doesn't answer according to a timeline. He doesn't lift you up according to when you wanted. And now if he can get you to not go to God with the next problem, oh boy, does he have you. And so today is a day that we repent for all the times we've lost hope and believe the devil's lie and haven't interpreted situations with God's revealings but rather by our feelings. Because here's the truth. Next fill in. We have hope because God's promises are sure. Whether it feels like it or not. I love this promise about prayer. In 1 Peter it says this, it says, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. And to describe why we're righteous, we're righteous through faith. Faith has credited us. Jesus' righteousness is very clear in the Bible. And so if I am a believer, I can know I have been heard by God. And then there's so many promises that find their fulfillment in the New Testament. I want to show you a picture of, of, of what that looks like. All the Old Testament prophecies and their fulfillment in the New Testament. What God has done. And so I can tell you, and this probably won't even be news to you, that Jesus is the offspring of the woman come to crush the devil's head. And Jesus is the son of Abraham who is a blessing for all nations. And Jesus is the king on David's throne who will reign forever. And Jesus is the suffering servant who was pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. And Jesus was born of a virgin named Mary. And he was born in Bethlehem, the town of David. And a star guided the worshipers for the very first Christmas all according to plan. And you know what that means? It means we have hope. Because God keeps his word. And hope has a name. Jesus, he saves. Emmanuel, God with us. Christ, the anointed one. Messiah, the deliverer. And even when I feel like God is cruel, he's still good. When I feel he isn't there, he'll never leave me or forsake me. And when I feel like he can't make a way, he is the way maker who works all things for my good. This is the revealing of our God. And it's why we are a people of hope. And so may hope be renewed. But in this lesson, there's so much to learn beyond these fulfilled promises. And I want to talk a little bit about John the Baptist. What John the Baptist reminds me of is a role model. I don't know, do you have anyone who you look up to? Think to yourself, who do you look up to? Who would you say is a, a role model? With our young people, I used to teach Axis class. In fact, I remember when Johnny and Jakey were uh, in Axis class, and I think I learned from Johnny, and I know I'm putting you on the spot. I hope that's okay. Um, but but uh, thank you. Um, I remember learning about Mr. Beast. Yes, I do. And, um, and now today, Mr. Beast is a role model for a lot of young people. And, and, and if you're like me who haven't heard of Mr. Beast, let me just share with you a little about Mr. Beast. Mr. Beast is one who will buy a $600,000 firework and just spend the money to see what that looks like. 
Uh, Mr. Beast is one who will fill his backyard with Orbeez so that he can just have uh, a pool full of Orbeez or a backyard full of Orbeez. But maybe the most incredible thing and what the kids really want is the giveaways. See, Mr. Beast is known for giving away a ton of cash. Uh, he'll go to a store and say, whatever you can fit in this square, it's yours. He'll give away 35 cars. He'll, he'll buy five Walmarts full of stuff just to give them away. And so maybe there is something to, you know, admire in that. There, there's a, a, a heart of generosity that I see. I'm not, I'm not sure if I evaluated his level of stewardship that God would align to the waste of a $600,000 firework, but okay. <clears throat> But if you're looking for a role model and you come to church, you really find a good one today, don't you? Because Jesus described John the Baptist in this way. He said this. He said, truly I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than the beast. No. John the Baptist. No one is greater. So number one, Jesus Christ. Number two, you want to take an example from, you want to learn from, you should learn from John the Baptist. And there are three areas that I think we pick up on when it comes to the lifestyle of John the Baptist. Uh, number one, he's a worshiper. He's a good worshiper. There's this meme that's going around about John the Baptist that says this, that a fetus was the first person to rejoice in the presence of Jesus. Now, I love that statement for a couple reasons. Number one, it proves that every soul, no matter the age, is important to God. Even the conceived children in the womb. That's awesome. And so when the sunshine singers come up and we hear them tell God's message, whew, I don't know if I can do better. Great job. Every soul matters. And as a worshiper who... When Mary announced the idea that Jesus was coming, that the baby leapt in, in the womb of Elizabeth, uh, he, he proved what worship looks like. He, he said, I must decrease and he must increase. And when the disciples were looking for an answer, uh, he didn't point to himself. Rather, he said, look, look not at me, look at the Lamb of God. He takes away the sin of the world. And that's what a worshiper is like. It says, it's not about me. Reminds me of this book I wrote is ironic every time I turn to it, right? <laughs> and thank you, by the way, for your grace in celebrating with me, the grace of encouraging. Um, it, it was a fun project to write because it was a chance just to try to give God great glory. And one of the lines that I truly believe, and I, I wrote about in this book, the end of chapter 3 said this, see, when people see us, they miss the point. When people see Jesus, they have everything they need to be wowed, forever. Do you believe it? Do you believe if it's about my name, they miss the point? My name will be forgotten. Your name will be forgotten. But Jesus' name is the only name that will save. He's a worshiper. Number two, he's countercultural. Some of you grew up in Sunday school and Bible class. Do you remember where John lived, what he ate, and what he wore? This always strikes people. So let's start with the, the, the most phenomenal one the kids are surprised at. What did John eat? Locusts, yeah. And is that a UK thing, like chocolate-covered locusts? Like, is that a thing somewhere? It's not in America. I don't like Christmas presents. Ah, nope. He did it. Number two, what did he wear? Camel skin. Yep, camel skin, which is, uh, I don't know, sounds scratchy. Um, <laughs> number three, where did he live? In the wilderness, in the desert. He didn't live among the people. And what was very clear in his lifestyle is that he was not a conformist. He was not trying to conform to the time. What he was trying to do is say, the people of God do, do, do things differently. And, and that's so important for us to pick up on. See, the lifestyle of a Christian should also be one, at one point or another, that says, I don't follow the ways of the world. And the ideologies that are popular, I don't always agree with, particularly where it's sinful. And when the society says sin is okay, I'm going to say, nope, God didn't change his mind. And when society wants to get away from God with different ideas about how to live or what to do, we're going to say, nope, God's ways are good. And it's going to become more and more apparent, I believe, in our time, the longer our lives go here in America, that we are going to look countercultural and we must act that way. We must represent a God whose mind has not changed, whose ways still are good in a society that questions it and says, no, we have a new revelation. And by the way, it's based on my feeling, not God's revelation. 
So we have to be countercultural. The third thing we can learn about from John the Baptist is his message. If you would sum up the whole of his message, you could use one word. That word would be repent. And that's actually how we prepared God's people through that message of repentance. It said in, in our lesson, so he will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. He will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of parents to their children, the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make a people prepared for the Lord. And this is so essential because as we talk about bringing people back, we're on a mission to reach the lost. We want that here. We want a revival here. For anyone and everyone who walks through these doors to have their hearts prepared for the Lord. And so we have a message of repentance, a message that says we are sinners and we struggle with sin. We're going to confess. And then we're going to see our need for a Savior and you better believe we're going to proclaim that our Savior is here. And that he loves to forgive. And that as far as the east is from the west, so far has your moved the transgressions of repentant believers. Hallelujah. And so why do we have hope? Our next fill-in. Hope is here through the methods and the message of John the Baptist. And what a wonderful example he was. But now as we leave today, we have a vision of what God could do in our hearts if he sunk this message so deep in our soul that it became the foundation of godly living, what would it look like to be a people of hope? Well, one commentator said this about hope. This is what hope would look like. Hope can look like believing in the impossible and defying the odds. It could look like moving mountains and changing lives, embracing uncertainty and healing when you've been hurt, Showing up when you could have run away and opening yourself up to possibilities. Hope is in the courage of Peter, who stood before a crowd on Pentecost. And he gave the same word that John the Baptist used, repent. And 3,000 turned to the Lord. Hope is in the confidence of Paul, who said it doesn't really matter if I'm well-fed or hungry, if I'm in plenty or in want. That doesn't matter because I have a confidence that I can do all these things through God who strengthens me. I'm going to make it. Hope isn't a woman who is subject to bleeding and had the audacity to think that if she just meets with Jesus, if she just touches Jesus, Jesus could do something about it, and, she, and he did. What would hope look like in your life? Hope might be confidence that God's got you. Hope might be courage to do what you didn't do before. Hope might be audacity and perseverance to keep on keeping on in a world that doesn't because you know God is eternal and his ways are good. You know, something I love about our God, this line that when we are faithless, he is faithful because he cannot disown himself. And hope is this idea that even when I doubt his goodness, he's still good. When I doubt his presence, he's still there. When I doubt he can forgive, all my sins have been cleansed through the blood of Jesus what would hope look like for you this Christmas? How could it guard and guide you? Perhaps hope looks best through the words of Isaiah. Because he said about people who hope in the Lord, you know what they do? Those who hope in the Lord, they renew their strength. And they soar on wings like eagles. They run and they don't get weary. They walk and they aren't faint. Because we have a God supporting us. A God who is the epitome of everything we hope for. All the hopes of all the years are met in him at Christmas. Let's be a people of hope. Let me pray for you. So Heavenly Father, forgive us for the times we've lost our hope. Renew us, Lord. Give us courage. Give us confidence. Remind us that when we are faithless, you are faithful. You are always good, Lord. And Lord, as we continue on, help us always to trust your revelation over how we feel. Let the devil not steal our hope. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
And the peace of God, which transcends our understanding, may it guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. All right, we turn our attention to um, a confession of faith, and we just love confessing who God is, what he's done for us. Uh, Let's use the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.